All right, everyone, welcome back. We are Radio Cora. And you know what we do at Radio Cora? We treat everyone right. That's what we're going to be doing with our next uh, interview. His name is uh, Adrian Lowe, but don't get uh, distracted by the how he spells Lowe. And we're broadcasting from Denver, Denver, Colorado, at the, I have to always look at this because it's a big, long conference name, APTA, Combined Sections Meeting. And I mean, right now there's there's probably, oh, I think a million people, not now, no, uh, I'm, I'm exaggerating, quite frankly, I am. But we're going to have a great interview. This is going to be uh, talking a little bit about pain. No, not pain with the heart because it is Valentine's Day. No pain that uh, we got to manage. So Adrian's our man. He knows everything about pain. He knows a lot about rugby, too. <laughs> How you doing, man? I'm good. Hey, when would you get to Denver? Uh, Wednesday afternoon. Yeah? Yep. Did you like yesterday's uh, conference? I love it. I, this is an amazing event. The tech is out of, you know, me being a, a, one of those tech nuts oh you know 20 years ago you show up there were like three booths with a cane and a wedge and a shoe <laughs> and now we got virtual reality <laughs> augmented reality it is <laughs> and then you get to you get to test drive the fun stuff it's like can i get in it well sure you can it's like okay man i'm all into it so you're into rugby yes sir <laughs> i got i got hooked on rugby mm-hmm. when uh i went to bath Okay. And so I, I was in Bath, and then, and then of course, they have, a, they have a team. And then I, I said, oh, 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 oh. That was the rugby trash talk uh, race. <laughs> but anyway, I just, I was stunned at how fast everything goes. Yeah. And it just keeps going. Yeah. And if you get hurt, so what? I, I don't care. You, you, okay. We're running past you. I don't care, man. It's just, you know, drag you off. And I love that. Do they deal with pain? Of course not. There's no pain in rugby. Are you kidding me? <laughs> if there is, they just they, they no. just cover it up. Absolutely. No, they keep moving. So. Yeah. Okay, so this is going to be an incredible interview because I'm, I'm really fascinated by it because we also talked to Jesse and, and I was just just amazed at where we, as, a, as a, an industry, as a, a clinician PT industry, mm-hmm. where we stand in our knowledge of just pain. You know, and uh, Jesse just, I mean, I'm telling you, you got a high bar. I I do. I mean, I'm just a little podcast trash. I'm just, I'm always going to just lean towards her just that way. That's fine. Okay. So we're going to talk a little bit about pain. We're going to have five points that we're going to expand upon. And then, but first off, I want to make sure that that everybody understands who you are, where you come from and all that good stuff. And what, uh, how'd you get into this whole thing? Sort of. Yeah. Lay the foundation on Quickest who you are. thing is, um, I was, I'm from South Africa, so trained as a physical therapist. Came to America, uh, you know, going to come for one year, make a million dollars as a PT, retired, never worked that way. Um, trained as an orthopedic sports medicine manual therapist, and then the things that were taught in school just didn't work anymore. And I started seeing more complex patients, which took me to the pain route. And, um, you know, I had some of the most incredible mentors that was just so kind to me that I asked for help, and they, they took me this path. If you told me today... In, I would sit here in 2020 and say, I'm an, I'm an expert in pain or chronic pain. I would have said, you're out of your mind. Um, when I was trained, it was very black and white. It was, this is the way things work. This is your, you know, pain is worse when your arm goes up and pain's better when your arm goes down. That's it, black and white, done. And pain is way more complicated. And this has been an incredible journey. And then my life took me towards the research side as a neuroscientist studying pain. Because I got more questions than answers. And then I started, well, let's start studying. And you do one study and before you know it. And this has been an incredible journey. And the more we learn, the less we know, right? You know the classic story. But, um, but it's true. Wow. Yeah. Because you're not just talking about that, that physical that pain here, elbow. There's a lot that goes on with that pain from a whole body point of view. Absolutely. We have, I mean, it's not that far away that we believe that pain was housed in the body. I mean, we now know pain is 100% from your brain. No brain, no pain. If you, you can have an injury and be unaware of it, right? That's why athletes. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So you can have an injury and be unaware of it. You, yeah. you go get a cup of coffee in the morning, you notice a bruise in your body, like, where did that come from? But you cannot have pain and not know about it. Your brain is part of it. And we're now beginning to see it as we scan the brain, we're looking at the brain and whatever. There's it's so much occurring. But again, you know, the cool thing about it is if the brain's involved, it means we can target the brain as a primary area to treat. Um, so, so there's been incredible advances in how we look at pain. The, uh, you, you touched upon a point that is really interesting, and, and, and through my, my, my career, there is the, the traditional education component 
and that that mm -hmm. that institution training future. Yep. But but it seems like there is there's a, a tremendous gap on where the industry and leaders and, and thought mm -hmm. leaders are ha are currently where they're at. Yeah. There's that gap. How, how do you get institutions to say, hey, yeah. you know, Adrian, man, he's got this stuff, and we got to we we've got to create a you know class in that. Yeah, so the problem is that traditionally there's, there's this saying that, I mean, if you've developed something new today in therapy, it takes about 17 years to work its way into curriculums. 17, 17 years. Yeah, so it takes a while because a lot of it has to do, Scott, for example, with, <laughs> with um, testing and exams. Bottom line is I teach at multiple universities and there's one job for academia, and I'm not having a go at them. I mean, I work with them all the time. Their only job is to make students pass board exams. If, the, if students, mom and dad pays a lot Incredible. of money, then guess what? We've got a bigger problem. And that's one thing. So we got to make sure students, the problem is the exams are still outdated. And so we got to teach to the test, if you will. But the test cannot keep up with what we're doing. Because we get together every year at CSM, the smartest people, and make the next test and the next. So there's this. But the cool thing is, when there's something very important and urgent, it can, it can compress it. For example, right now, the opioid and pain epidemic is so overwhelming that this 17-year time span is being compressed faster. What we started building on the pain neuroscience side is now almost mainstream in every PT school. It's working its way. Um, here at CSM, there are dozens of presentations on the work we're doing. So, cup half full here, no doubt about it. Uh, but it takes a little while. There is, it's just the, the matter of, we gotta teach the students, it's, we gotta write new textbooks, it's gotta get in curriculums, we gotta change the test, that takes time. Um, but that's the biggest reason. But this is a journey too, as well. You, yeah. you, you never stop. And we were having this conversation before the podcast where, the advancement, the innovation just keeps yep. chugging along and you can't expect your typical mm -hmm. institutions to be able to tr keep up with that speed. But that's not the idea. I mean, nobody's ever yeah. said a student should graduate top of the class or yeah. top of the profession. We have to have skilled um, clinicians that come out can treat people basically correct, if you will. The next level is the residency, the fellowships, the, the next training, if you will. Yeah. So we cannot expect the student that graduates tomorrow to be at a PhD level of what we're doing. There has to be a base competency, and, and that's happening, by the way. I am very encouraged what we're doing in our profession, but are, are they at the tip of the spear? No, we're barely there, but it's okay. It's okay to not know yet, because I, as I tell people, what I teach you today, if this is the same next year, I failed you, because we've got to keep pushing the envelope, yes. and that's okay. And that is, yeah. that's, yeah. that's great. And in fact, uh, Jesse said it's okay for me to fail. Oh, absolutely. <laughs> Failure is good. It's actually a very good thing for therapists. It yeah. is. But what, what I find from, it's very collegial. Yep. When you get past and you're, let's say I am stamped PT per, and then there's just other mm -hmm. things that can be accomplished yep. going forward, but it's still very collegial. Everybody's yep. like, oh no, let me help you out. Yep. And they're very forthcoming with, yep. with solutions different way of thinking and that's what uh, you bring to the table and and your organization evidence in motion i didn't point that out by the way that's okay no i have take <laughs> note you. you listeners i want to but because we're going to be venturing into pen and paper section of this particular podcast there we go. okay so <clears throat> with that said you got mad skills fantastic everybody knows that thank you and he likes rugby <laughs> which i like there you go. So we're going to talk about, if you're listening out there, let's get your pen and paper because this is important stuff. We talked about, or we're going to be sort of expanding upon five points. And the first point is, is the misconception of pain. That's one, right? Write that down. That's one. How to, I believe, how to alter that misconception. Correct. Correct. Okay. And the education by itself, where we say it's not enough, we have to change the behavior that's another thought that's number three number three if you're keeping notes out there and then there is hope right there is neuroplasticity that provides that hope so write that down and then the last one be the difference and if that's that's the closing hey raw get you, you are there the you difference man yeah. so let's start with number one the misconception of pain let's talk a little bit about that yeah so you know there's what, 200,000 plus physical therapists in America, and every day we go to the office to kill all pain. We see pain as the enemy. And what we need to fundamentally understand, pain is normal. It's a normal human experience. If you cannot experience pain, you'd be dead. There are 12 people in the world today we're aware of that has congenital insensitivity to pain called Mendelian disorder, where they cannot process pain. They put their hand on a hot stove, they don't know about it, and it puts their life at risk. They don't live wow. very long. So we, we've always seen pain as the enemy. Let's get the painkillers, let's get kill all pain. But pain is normal. 
Pain teaches us um, heart is bad, sharp is bad, infection, go get some help. It's a good thing. When pain lasts more or longer than it's supposed to, it becomes a problem for us. Chronic pain is not normal. Living in pain is not normal. Suffering is not normal, but pain is normal. And so one of the things, Scott, that I think we need to understand as therapists is we shouldn't be afraid of pain. Pain's not the enemy. We need to embrace the concept that pain is a normal experience because if you understand that pain is normal, then your behavior changes as well. Um, if we see pain always as the enemy, you sprain your ankle this afternoon, right. it triggers all this negativity where it's like, okay, I sprained my ankle. I'm going to be okay. The ankle's heal. Um, let's far away from the heart. Exactly. <laughs> so so, so th th there's this fundamental understanding. I mean, we, have, we are developing the most incredible drug surgeries, I mean the most heroic things to kill pain and, and, and we need to understand pain is a good thing. If you had surgery yesterday, a back surgery, pain teaches you today do not run the Denver Marathon today. That's it's right. not a good thing to do today, but you could probably do it in a couple of months. Right. And so pain's a good thing. We've just looked at pain very wrong and what we have found is, um, you know, if you teach people this concept that pain is normal um, and normalizing the experience, um, it's actually quite helpful for them to go, oh, I've never thought of it that way. Now, I know there's people listening right now, but you don't understand it. I've had pain for 30 years, yeah. you, know, you stupid therapists. Are... Nowhere am I saying living in pain is normal. I, I cannot even fathom how somebody must feel. I mean, I, this, is, this is the most gut-wrenching when somebody sits with you for 30 years of pain. I'm not negating their pain experience, um, but we need to start shifting how we see pain because that gives us an opportunity to treat it different. Because the way it's, we're doing it, is not working. We've never drugged, injected, cut as much as we do right now. And pain's getting worse, not better. Uh, not even close. So we have to fundamentally rethink pain. And if we can start with the idea pain's a normal human experience, but what you do about it is critical. So you and I hurt our backs today. You decide to take drugs, get an MRI, see the surgeon, whatever. I lay low for a day, go, that's back pain, everybody's got it, no big deal. I'll give it a few days and see how I do fundamental different shift. It's what you do when you get pain that is so incredible. So for example, you're at this conference. We did a study recently. We interviewed therapists at a conference. 90% of therapists at the conference have had back pain while treating people with back pain. And 60% wow, believe they had more pain than the person they were treating. What percentage of them took a day off work? Zero. Zero. Why? Because they didn't freak out. If a therapist, any of these therapists hurt their back right now and I put a stethoscope on their brain, I could listen, they would go, that's back pain. Everybody's got it. How much you can do for it? Give it a little time. How cool is that? That's the behavioral part of the don't freak out about it because they understand pain is normal and it's okay for a few days. But why, why do we have that? I, I hear what you're saying and I'm, I'm like, yeah, I, I got it. You know, I've had <laughs> back pain. I play sports and I just lay low and it's like, Ah, it's money to be made, Scott. We have medicalized back pain. I'm from South Africa and people ask me every weekend, if we go to deep Africa today and chop down a little piece of forest and put a Hora East Africa clinic right. there, will people with back pain show up? The answer is yes. People have back pain there too. They just don't call it back pain. They just sit around the fire at night going, that was a hard day of work. I can feel my back a little. Let's have another drink. We medicalize and say, if you feel that, that's bad. You should come see us and you need uh. this and this and this. And um, I've always said, if, if I won the lottery tomorrow, I'd put up billboards all over this country. I'll pay for all of it. And the billboard would say, do you have back pain? Well, so does everybody else. Have a great day. Now, will, oh, wow. will Pfizer that's pay like for a, that? Yeah. What? Will Pfizer pay for that? The drug no, companies? Do you no. think the American Academy of Orthopedic no, Surgeons No, and in will? fact, it just society as a whole would say, no, that, I can't process <laughs> that. It, it's true. So far, and right? It's, tr How it's cool true. But, but, <laughs> but in that back pain scenario, yeah. not everything's life-threatening. How do you mm -hmm. and how would you deal with that individual that says, I've had back pain for 30 years. Yep. You don't know what you're talking about. The first thing I would do, I would listen to them. I would validate them and say, absolutely, I'm not you. I, I, you know, sure, have I had back pain? Sure, but I'm not you, absolutely. Have you had back pain? I totally understand it. But let me teach you how pain really works. And again, one of the fundamental things, you know, we do these pain neuroscience courses and people come week after week and then I get these inevitable emails. You know, I had a patient, I tried on him and he, you know, he flipped me off and he walked out of the door and said, I, I hate you guys, whatever. We have to create a relationship. It's a human being and you cannot negate their pain. You cannot minimize it. And so the biggest thing I teach my students often is, you know, create a relationship, listen to them, say, tell me about your back. How does it impact your life? Get to understand them. Because when that happens, they realize you care. The biggest thing we can do is show we care. 
Because within that, the patient actually will often calm and say, okay, what do you think? And that gives you that opportunity. Remember, Scott, this is, huh. it's real. There's, pain is real. Uh, you know, I, it I, is. I'm You're very right. fortunate <laughs> as a yeah. scientist right now. We scan people's brains. We have never scanned fake pain. All pain is real. How, can, how dare I turn to you and say, no, it cannot do that. Who, right. who am I? I'm nobody. Every person's pain. I tell my patients all the time, you own your pain. And if the healthcare provider doesn't give you the answer you're looking for, stand up, go somewhere else. It's okay, it's your pain, you own it. Don't let anybody own your pain. So if somebody treats you, mistreats you, treats you disrespectful, go somewhere else. So in a, in a, in a ways around what I'm trying to say is, um, we cannot forget the human aspect. I can sit here and explain to you the pain stories that every all, all the listeners know, and let's talk about a sensitive alarm, That's let's talk about this, but I think it's that human aspect of, you know what, I, I agree with you, Scott. I, I, I'm not you, and I, I can only imagine how you must feel, but let's talk about this. And then you build this relationship with this human being called the patient. And see what you're trying to do and establish that relationship mm -hmm. like you just said and be able to just begin to, for lack of a better term, talk them off the ledge a little bit, start to relate, and then and then start to navigate to the to an area where there might be some, just 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 to crack the door open in hope, just a, yeah. Yeah, a tad bit. You know, Scott, with the opioid and pain epidemic right now, people, patients are hungry for the basic elements of compassion, empathy, respect. And I tell my students, we wow. can teach you the most advanced neuroscience on the planet, but if you cannot be respectful, empathetic, compassionate, you're not going to make this. You're not going to make this profession. And did that change somebody's life? Sure, it is. We have research to prove it. But you're right. It takes them just that step down. Just, just, just. But remember, I always, you know, say, uh. why do we as therapists cry in the clinic? Because we peel onions. It's layers. You just peel layers and layers and layers. They're mad. They're angry. They're resentful. And I don't blame them. We have not treated them as well as we could. But this new research, the way we look at stuff, has changed how we see things. Like, wow, this is, yeah. <laughs> okay, so I, I, without me just going off on a tangent, because oh, we will. <laughs> However, let's get to number two. How do we alter? How do we begin to say okay? Because what you're really talking about is is all in the head. It's 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 sort of the the brain side of things. Is that not correct? Or, yeah. So because so, I I'll have a I'll have a pain here, but you know there's some people who are saying yeah it's a pain I don't care yeah I'm moving on it, it, it's fine I've had them sure and I just move on. So how do you make that, how do we do that? Yeah, so before I head that way, I do want to make okay, a comment. Because please. people often, you know, the classic thing you, when you start teaching people about pain, especially patients, they often go, oh, oh, you think it's in my head. Which the, it's the assumption that it's not real, right? Interesting. So I'll give you a yes. beautiful quote. By yes. My, so my mentor, David Butler, who I think the world of, made this beautiful quote. The art, and this is for therapists, by the way, the art of explaining pain to a patient is to tell them it's in their head without telling them it's yeah. in the head. It's, it, it's, so your pain's real. It's biological. It's in your brain. If I scan your brain right now, there, if I punch you in the arm, there is activity in your brain. But it doesn't mean it's not real. It doesn't mean it's fake. This is a leftover remnants of the Cartesian model of pain 300 years ago. It's either in your body or your head. It's either real or not real. Ah. So, so that's why I say this compassion empathy is really important where some go, you know, this guy believes me. And that's a great first step. But um, to answer the question, how do we change this? Education. The cool thing is we now have done so much research from literally from grade school level all the way through about anything you can imagine. We have found out people are hungry to learn about pain. And guess what? When we teach them about pain, they get better. So, so when we measure patients' knowledge of pain, we can measure, there's a scale. I teach them how pain really works and they, and they go, I got it. The pain goes down. Healthcare providers, the therapists listening, if I teach them about pain in a classroom, they become more empathetic, compassionate, and caring about their patients. How cool is that? Don't we want that? Yeah. So, so this is fundamental. We got to teach patients. We got to teach our healthcare providers, because we we don't know a lot about pain. We have never really studied much about pain, and now that we do, we need to teach people. And guess what? We have found out people's lives are better for it. But as Jesse showed, probably there's an art to doing it. But see, you're, you're talking about tangible. That's that's yes. statistically. Yep data backed up, quantifiable solutions. We have tons of research right now that shows if we teach people in pain, the pain gets better. We have multi-centered clinical trials, three-year outcomes, um, and, and that's okay with patients. The, the thing that excites me the most right now, Scott, 
if you really want to change the world, we got to go and teach people so much about pain that when they get pain, they go, I got it. The guy with the funny accent explained it. I'm going to be okay. Yeah. And we're doing that right now in middle schools. We just got done with a multi-center trial in six states. We taught middle school kids about pain. Half the kids got our pain, how pain really works. The other group got traditional sprain, strain, bad tissue pain models that's always taught. And we track these kids in school. Our group, less drugs six months later, taking less drugs for pain, miss less days for school, miss less PT. We should start upstream to have a downstream effect. And that's what we're working on right now. The upstream time. component. Absolutely. So that's that education yes. element. And yeah. Because <clears throat> you're absolutely spot on. If I say, hey, it's in your head, <laughs> I'm going to have that. Yeah, I am. I'm going to, I'm going to, yeah. I'm going to say, you're full of it. Yeah. Stop that. Yeah. And then, then it, right off the bat, it defeats the purpose of just having to understand. Yeah. And, and alter my understanding of pain. Yeah. I love it. All right. You guys, you know he's, a, he's, he's incredible. That's Adrian Lowe. Evidence of motion. We're going to go on to number three. Number three is education by itself changing behavior. Talk to us a little bit about that, number three. Yeah. Education by itself is, for lack of a better term, it's useless to change behavior. In America, we spend $2.1 trillion a year teaching T. people. T. Not B, not <laughs> M. T. T. Trillion dollars a year telling people smoking causes cancer. And only one in five people go, you know, I should probably stop smoking. We cannot print it big enough on cigarette wow. packages and people are like, yeah, give me two packs. You have to have a behavioral component. So for therapists listening today, point. you cannot explain pain out of people. I've tried. You, can, you cannot hit it out of them. You cannot force it. Them. The thing that pain neuroscience education, how pain works, that, that education of let me teach you how pain works, what it does, it calms you to allow you to move. And what made you better? Movement. Movement is the biggest painkiller on planet Earth we've ever measured, Scott. When you, when you say movement, the, the Exercise, move. Exercise, Like, like I, I'm flow, getting oxygen, up out of my chair yeah. and I'm, I'm going to get my cup of coffee and it's movement. Yeah, there's so many different ways of moving. And this, you can talk about aerobic exercise, you can talk about isometric exercise, you can talk about all different kinds of exercise. If you go for a six-mile run today, your brain produces 10 milligrams of morphine. You break your arm today, we're going to give you two or three milligrams in the ER to set your arm. Wow. Huh. But here's the thing. People in pain won't move because they're afraid. I'm going to hurt myself. It's true. What pain education does, it's like painting your house. You've got to put a primer on to paint the wall. Pain neuroscience is the primer to make you move. What made you better? Movement. And every therapist here are skilled. This conference is about movement. Move, move, move. The only thing we have, I'm going to say crack the code, but what we figure out is people in pain won't move. Can we get them to move? And that's what this education does. It primes them to move. And so every therapist listening to me today, you are the expert. You are so well equipped. The only piece missing is you got to get people over that hump. Scott's afraid of his back. Like, I'm just afraid of my back. If I teach and you go, oh, cool. So actually what you're saying is my back is okay. The nerves are a little bit sensitive. That's why I feel my back, but it's okay to move. I, I talk you through the process, which takes some graded exposure. Like, let's try a little bit. Back off. How are you doing? I'm, I'm okay. Try again a little bit more. Two minutes of walking becomes three, becomes four, becomes... The Boston Whatever. Marathon. Yeah. But, but the, the critical thing, and some of our listeners will huh. see very soon a really good paper we submitted. That some of the, we took all the experts, and we basically agreed to this thing that pain education by itself is not that powerful. It, you cannot explain pain out of people. It's the motion part, the moving part that's critical. Does it, does it establish trust? Yes. And it, it is like, yes. okay, he said move. I, now I trust him. That he's speaking truth. Yes. So I don't know if Jesse dropped this little bombshell on you, but we have a colleague, Corey Zimney, one of the smartest guys I've ever met in my life. Um, amazing. His PhD boils down to one word. What makes this thing work when I teach you about pain comes down to one word, trust. If they trust you, they'll do stuff for you. If you yes. trust me, you will move even though you hurt. And that, how, do you, how do you develop trust, Scott? You treat people with respect. You listen to them yeah. with dignity. It's, it's, that's what I'm trying to say. You know, yeah. there's this thing in therapy we often say, well, this thing like trust, empathy, compassion, that's kind of like the soft skills. It's essential skills. Yeah. We have for years, oh, that's a, no, it's, yeah. it's the essential skills. And then we have this tool on top of it. Let me just teach you how pain works. Oh, and now you're willing to move. And it's, it's mind blowing. The results are stunning. Isn't that just, it, it, it sounds so simple, yet it's not. It's, no. it's like, yeah, I get it. 
Yeah. And even, even even in my life, you know, I'll, I'm you know I work around all the time. <laughs> I'm doing, by the way, Pilates and yoga. If you can believe way that. Way to go! Very it, good evidence for that. Oh, it's killing me, man. <laughs> <laughs> but it's good type of pain. Yeah. <laughs> but but I do feel better. Yeah. I know that yeah. I'm saying yes. I'm going, and there's a movement, and now I yes. trust. And it started, just started with a little movement. I'm not sitting there balancing on my one leg and I'm successful. Yeah. I just said, okay, give it to, okay, I did it. And it's just trust. Yeah. And that's that's a powerful word. Yes. I didn't realize that. Mm-hmm. Look, at, I'm, a, I'm a better person now because yeah, of you. And by the way, in, in a clinical scenario, a patient develops trust between a clinician in less than one second. It's almost instantaneous. It's, it, it doesn't develop over visits and upon visits. It's that whole how you set yourself up. Um, Isn't it that is, interesting? It's mind-blowing. It's less than really? a fraction of a second that people, they instantly trust you or not based on how you frame what you're doing. So what happens if that one second proved that I don't trust you? Like, I go to you. Patients and I... won't do what you're doing. They will have this superficial learning process. They won't, get, they won't go to the next level. And very likely, they'll do stuff like they'll cancel appointments. They won't come back anymore. They'll go find somebody else. So let me ask you this. What do you do? What do you, let's say you're still, it doesn't, it's not a reflection on you yep. as a clinician. It's just something didn't click. Yes. And then, but you still, as a clinician, have a passion mm-hmm. to help this individual, yep. you know, yep. get past it. What do you do? Treat hey, him, I see it. Treat him with compassion, empathy, respect. I've had many guys walk in my clinic. So let's put it in fancy speak today. They're in the behavior change model. You and I decide we want to change our behavior. I, I want to lose weight. You go through phases, pre-contemplation, contemplation. There's all these phases we go through, right? Pre-contemplators are the people, I, they're, they're basically what we call fat and happy. Don't bother me, I'm happy. The smoker, that you know what, I made this choice, I'm happy with it, let me be. Pre-contemplators are those people. You give them the best message, but at the wrong time. They're not ready to change. How do you treat these people? You treat them with compassion, respect, and dignity. You don't try and force this on them. So what I do in the clinic with these guys, Scott, patients, first of all, I listen to them, tell me a story, what brings you here, how can I help you? And if this guy, well, I'm only here because a doctor won't give you my hydrocodone, I'm only here to keep my wife off my back. He doesn't really want to be there, right? But he has to. But I, I still have an opportunity. It's a human being that made it, that's still coming in. So if I treat him or her well, I'll say, you know, for example, you know, have you had therapy? Yeah, I had an old ACL injury in high school. Okay, what did they do? Well, they did some stim and heat on me. Did you like it? Yeah, I did. Well, how about we try there? Start with the easiest, lowest thing. Now, every clinician here knows some of these, some of our treatments have higher levels of, it doesn't matter. It's right. an entry point. But during these three or four visits that they do something relatively benign, very comfortable, that they've had a good experience, maybe a few simple little stretches, he sees that I'm treating him different than the previous clinician, the previous clinician. I've had so many patients that visit three or four, you know, I'm sorry, I've been kind of a jerk to you. What, what did you just do? He opened the door and say, let me tell you a little bit of what's going on. You, you, so you, you, but you still treat him with respect and dignity and compassion. I love it. Yep. All right. <laughs> that's, uh, that's Adrian Lowe. Evidence of motion, what we have covered so far, misconception of pain, how we alter that mindset, the education by itself, we've got to change the behavior. And that brings us to a, a really interesting topic that I want to talk about is that neuroplasticity. That's, we've, we've established what we need to do. Now there's, let's start venturing into hope. Yeah, the biggest thing we can give patients is hope. Unfortunately, we often believe that, you know, this is the way I am. Patients come in, they've had pain for 30 years. This is the way, this is my destiny. I will be in a wheelchair one day. I'll have to build a ramp on my house to get in. My wife will probably leave me, yeah, right? yeah, yeah, So there's yeah. no hope. What people need to understand today, um, Scott, your brain is 125,000 miles of wiring or cabling. That gets replaced every three weeks. It completely rewires itself. We have nerve sensors in our body that replace itself every 48 hours. Neuroplasticity is this idea that our brain alters itself all the time. It learns constantly. And what it means, it can get better too. So when I tell people, um, you know, for example, watch this. If you take two fingers, you wiggle them forward or back. We scan your brain, there's two fingers in your brain. If I take tape and I tape your fingers together where they're gonna move, we often do this in rugby, right? You hurt your finger. Oh yeah, yeah. put some tape around it. (laughs) If your two fingers now move at the same time, it takes 15 minutes before the brain only has one finger in the brain. If you cut that tape and move it independently, boom, two fingers, that's plasticity. The brain adapts. But what the cool thing is it can adapt for the better. And when we explain stuff to like this to a patient, they go, you mean I can get better? Yes, ma'am. This is the biggest thing Because that's what the body's all about. It just, it's naturally, it does that. And then the patient says, you know, so I can get better? Yes, ma'am. 
Wow, so I can get less sensitive to cold? Absolutely, you mean I can move? Absolutely. And this is the biggest shift. In, in all of the work we're doing, this is the area that excites me the most because we're enhancing the brain, the most powerful thing you can for pain. If you alter somebody's brain, you're gonna change their life. And that makes it kind of, and I mean no disrespect to any of my therapy, but it kind of gets, for me now at my level, it gets mundane to work on a tendon. Yeah, because oh, the yeah, brain absolutely. is so powerful, but I know tendons are important and ligaments and muscles, whatever, but yeah. um, plasticity gives us hope. People that have been afflicted very poorly, even strokes, right? When somebody has a stroke and the arm cannot be moved, yes. what we now do is we take your uninvolved side, the normal side, and we tie it down which forces you to use this side and it wires the brain completely. There you go, that's where I was gonna go. I'm going to say, yes. give me something tactical that yes. I just said, you're saying, okay, there's this neuroplasticity, but when I come with, you yeah. just brought it out. That's how you can. Well, look at this one, yeah. right? Yeah, yeah my, I have a very painful hand. There's a condition called complex regional pain syndrome. One of the worst pain conditions any therapist will ever treat. If I turn my hand palm up and down with that condition, the pain spikes and takes 20 minutes to calm down. I now take you, that hand and I put it in a box and I slap a mirror on the side of it. I take this hand and put it here. Now it projects this hand here. Suddenly this hand looks normal. And the brain goes, hey, look at my hand. It's not swollen. I now move this hand. It looks as if this other hand's moving and they go, I must be okay. And the brain shuts it wow. down. Wow. How cool is that? That is cool, man. <laughs> <laughs> that, that, that is, I didn't realize yes, that. That's it, very it, cool. It, it, it blows our mind, but how cool is but that? But it's just the tip of the iceberg. Yeah. It's just the tip. Yeah. But you're... <laughs> Innovation, baby. I'm telling you. Yep. And it's the young generation that takes us on, so that the oldies like me have to start passing so, the baton. But but you're, you're, the, the company, Evan, it's in motion. Are you you, you, you recognize yeah. your back feeding? Oh yeah, we're training people by the boat. I hate boat. to say back are, feeding, but it, it's I, true. I you're, you're just absolutely, like absolutely, absolutely. We cannot train enough people. We have to train more people. We need to change this. It's funny. This is the first wow. time in 20 years at CSM I'm not speaking because I decided to take kind of one year, just I'm gonna walk around, meet people and <laughs> chat, whatever, podcast, but it's, um, I know. <laughs> but it's, um, yeah, we are training. I see the youngest, brightest, next generation taking this on, and, and I am so thankful, and for the young people, take it on, take it on. It's so cool because they, there, there's a level of passion that is just, it's electric. I'm, yeah. I'm interviewing these young people, and they're just like, yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> I did this, and I'm going here, and they just love it. Yeah. And what you're talking about is like, it's, it's just, I have to ask a question because you're just, you know, just that box analogy. Where do you see it going? Where oh. do you, you know, put on that future hat and see? Oh, yeah, we're, we're virtual reality. I mean, you can see here at CSM. There's there some is. Of those. There's a we are working with a VR company called Behavior that um, you can literally, you can remap body parts. You can, um, if you really want to know where it's going to go, wow. we're, we can now take your body part and put it in an avatar yeah. and treat the avatar and it affects your body pain. I mean, it just blows our mind from where we're going. And that's going. all the, 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 the that's, brain that's a section. a huge of it. part of it, yes. I mean, the, the future wild, is amazing. It's, it's a, yeah, absolutely. If I was a patient listening to that, I would say, wow, this wow. can change. Yes, sir. This is a message that needs to get out. Absolutely. One, after all of this stuff, move. It's it's important. Yeah. Move. Yeah. And then there's the, the, the hope of that. You blew my mind. Look at that. See? I'm, yeah those pathways are being regenerated but that to me is is fascinating yeah i would argue that if we talk about move just make sure you oh don't, don't listen to yeah. me I, listen yeah, to your PT. Would, no no i would just say movement's good but make sure you understand pain before you move because pain that's pain that's understood is not to be feared yeah that, so, that's a good point yeah no, pain, that makes sense yeah pain that is understood is not to be feared because maybe some of our patients are listening going but but when i move i hurt Exactly, but let's teach you how that works because your nervous system, your yeah. alarm system is a little sensitive. And so we always say, remember, start, start slow and build easy. Yeah. All right, it'll take a little time. So we always say, you know, so example, I had a gentleman come up clinic. Yeah. I asked him one day, yeah. I asked him, do you exercise? And he got mad at me, he said, of course I do. I said, what do you do? I walk two miles a day. I said, okay, how's it feel? Hurts like heck. I said, okay, why do you walk two miles a day if it hurts? And he had no answer. And I know it's a therapy, sports medicine because the internet says i have yeah to. <laughs> it's kind of that that it's kind of that marine corps mentality more is better yeah. and i ask him okay but that doesn't make any sense I said, how would a mile feel it would hurt a lot i said half a mile hurt a lot quarter of a mile i'll be fine i said why don't we start walking a quarter of a mile it blew his mind he never even thought of it i said why don't you in the morning get up walk a quarter of a mile and be done and say i had a great day and then That's as hard. you get a little bit better and healthier 
because the brain rewires the pain maps too. It goes, when you do something that was painful successfully, the brain goes, I must be okay. And it unwires the mapping associated with pain. Isn't that How cool is it? Now, this guy walks quarter of a mile and as he gets healthier, he works with me in the clinic, a quarter of a mile becomes a half a mile, becomes a, an occupational therapy, for example, has done this for years. But, yeah. so, so that's a critical part. Okay, that brings us into number five, by the way. By the way, my, I, I played that mental game with me. <laughs> is if I get up in the morning and I'm just like, okay, I know I got to get working out. Uh, I always set the standards like just 10 minutes, Scott. Just 10 minutes. <laughs> and somewhere. so I, yeah, I just go 10 minutes and then I realize, oh, I could go 20. There we go. <laughs> you know, see? it's all mental. It's, <laughs> it's all it is for me. Let's talk about be the difference because we did me, uh, mention uh, the youth, the energy, the innovation, everything. Talk to us a little bit about that, that yeah. point. I, you know, unfortunately, I have to take the podcast three levels down to the negative this morning. It, it, cannot, it cannot go unrecognized today. We may be sitting here, I, I got to meet yeah. you. This is a really amazing podcast. But today, 130 Americans will die from prescription opioids. We cannot forget that statistic. And so, hold it, hold it, hold it. 130 Americans today day will, will, die. will die from prescription opioids. There is an epidemic. The pain epidemic, the opioid epidemic. And so, Scott, when you yeah. and I just spoke, we had, you know, yeah. I'm very fortunate. I've been given platforms to travel to Washington, D.C., speak on very... So when I meet therapists, you know, like, but I'm just a therapist in a clinic seeing patients every day. What can I do? My message, number one, be the difference. I cannot treat every patient, right? right. But if you can be the best clinician you can every day, there are 200 plus thousand physical therapists at PTAs on top of it. If we bring in our friends called the OTs and the CODAs in, there's a half a million people right now, an army. And if we treated, every one of us taught, uh, was treating eight patients a day, now you're talking about four million people a day being influenced by the best. So, so there at CSM, my, my point is be a learner, constantly learn, go to the next course, go to the next thing, learn, be the best you, you can be. If you don't know what that is, email me, I will help you, I'll tell you books you should read, there's, there's so many cool things, there's, there's all this cool stuff. We're wow. Now in this day, there's books, there's podcasts, there's all this stuff, be the best you. And that I truly believe will change the, the country, the, the, the world for that matter. And so the young people, be, be there, study, learn, constantly learn, um, all the time. That, that is a powerful message. Okay, you listeners out there, we have five points. Five points that we want to go through just real quick. Once again, make sure you got your paper and uh, pencil out there. You know, there's a misconception of pain. Adrian, evidence in motion. You can reach out to him and find out more about that, right? Absolutely. Right. Is that, is that the best way to get a hold of you? Yeah, if they just go on our website. Um, I'm one of those old guys that decided to be, to not be as socially media active, but on our website, you can find me anywhere. Follow me. <laughs> there you go. There, there you go. <laughs> okay, that's number one. Number two, how to alter that understanding of pain. You can reach out to Adrian and his team. Yeah, just amazing. <laughs> amazing. By the way, you were pretty good. I'm going to have to just sort of Mediocre feedback. At to best. Mediocre at best. I get it. <laughs> All right, number three, education by itself. Change that behavior. You're going to have to do that. And then uh, number four, neuroplasticity. That is the hope. And then finally, you're an army out there, man. You, you PTs and OTs and everybody else, you clinicians out there, you're an army. You you can be the difference. That's hope. Absolutely. Yeah, awesome. Adrian is his name. Lo is his last name. That's A D R I A A N L O. UW, don't don't say it's spelled wrong. Don't don't go there. Evidence is motion is the is the company. Fantastic conversation. I'm a changed person, by the way. <laughs> Thanks, Scott. For the better or worse? Well, I'm a pretty simple guy, so it's probably for the better. <laughs> and you listeners out there, we're going to have another great interview. I'm not sure if it's going to top old Adrian here, but you stay tuned with uh, Core Radio because. Uh, Man, we're, we're trying to be the difference, right? Yep. That's right here with the information because you've got to constantly learn. So thank you very much. We're broadcasting from Denver at the APTA Combined Section Meeting. And I'm telling you right now, there's a gazillion people out there. Need to learn what uh, Adrian's preaching here. So thank you very much. Stay tuned. We'll be back with some more great interviews. Hey, thanks.